welcome to a very special EW10 on location bookmark coming to you for, actually from the set of Sunday Night Prime here at ITV Studios at the Dunwoody Seminary. And I'm here on the set of Father Apostoli's show, but we've changed around a little bit and uh, our special guest is the one and only Dr. Alice von Hildebrand. And we're speaking to Dr. Alice about her latest book, The Dark Night of the Body, Why Reverence Comes First in Intimate Relations. It's always a pleasure uh, to see you. And many times we've done interviews in the studios at EWTN, but uh, you know, uh, we, we came to see you this time. Well, that was very kind of you because of my age. It is not easy to take a long trip, you know, all the delays. So I'm honored and I thank you very, very much for inviting me. Well, let me say, uh, you know, I always thought of you as a lady, but now you're officially a quote-unquote dame. What does it mean to be a dame? And you got that award back in September. You know, I probably I have to get used to it. Mm -hmm. And I'm being too old to learn new tricks. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't think I can perform well as lady. I'm just going to continue to be what I've been. Always. Okay, the one and only Dr. Alice von Hildeberg. Now let me ask you, Dr. Alice, this book here is basically a collection of articles, right? Yes. That you wrote over, what, a couple of years period no, of time? Or? 18 months or so. Okay, 18 yes. months or so. And they're basically focused, uh, again, around having to do, you call it the dark night of the body, having to do with the theology of the body and yes. maybe some of the discussions that came up about some of the teachings that uh, Christopher West was maybe promoting the most. Well, you see, I do believe the inspiration of the book is the following. When I was 19, I discovered a book called In Defense of Purity mm -hmm. by Dietrich von Lillebrand. And uh, shortly afterwards, I make its acquaintance. And this book made a tremendous impression upon me. I had a very Catholic education. That was not the problem. But the problem is that by reading this book and studying this book, I had a much deeper insight into the beauty of God's invention in creating man, male and female, number one. The beauty of it, and simultaneously the data. Mm -hmm. You know, the very beginning, it tries to show that basically the idea of creating a male and a female of equal ontological dignity, but very different in their spiritual, religious, psychological, intellectual, affective, that they complement each other. Mm -hmm. Then the tragedy of original sin. And this is something that today we tend to forget. Original sin is a tremendous reality. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, inevitably, the devil was going to attack particularly in a domain which is so sublime, so beautiful, mm -hmm. and so central, namely the relationship between man and woman. Now, is it because of that book and because it was your husband's book that you have written on this topic on several books over yes. the years? And, and that's why your focus has been kind of on that. And that's why you decided uh, to write this book. Now, was this your idea to put the book together? Now, it was published by Roman Catholic no, books. I, no, I do believe it was a Roman Catholic book who approached me and they wanted, you know, therefore, there are 12 different articles, basically there are 15 or 16 mm -hmm. that I continued. But, I mean, he's one who put them together and some right, of them have repetitions inevitably. No, my point is the following. The beauty of the complementarity of man and woman. It's something magnificent when you realize that when God created Eve and Adam saw her, you know, immediately saw flesh of my flesh and blood in my blood, he recognized that they have equal dignity. And simultaneously, you can truly see, his response is enchantment, mm -hmm. enchantment. And then he pays her a compliment of such incredible beauty that modern women under the influence of feminism, forget. Call her the mother of the living. Can you imagine a more glorious title mm -hmm. than to be called the mother of the living? Now comes original sin. The devil addresses himself to Eve, my beloved, beloved St. Augustine, for whom I have awe and love and respect makes, I believe, a mistake when he says he turned to Eve because she was a weaker one. I think that is Not mistake. in your idea. I say sure. so no. in fear and trembling because he's a giant and I'm a dwarf. I believe he did it because he knew that she had a crucial role. Number one, mm -hmm. an enormous influence on Adam because women have no authority or less authority than men, but an enormous influence. And then number two, 
because she was a mother of the living. Mm -hmm. And as he was a murderer from the beginning, his hatred is against the woman. Right. And I mean, this is why I see abortion, mm -hmm. which is a consequence of feminism, as being the greatest victory of the devil since original sin. Now, this particular book, when we kind of focus that on to this book, where you talk The Dark Night of the Body is a bouquet of articles previously published by Catholic News Agency, etc. You say that they share a common theme to shed some modest light on the sublime Catholic teaching on the mystery of the intimate sphere, which you're kind of talking about. Those conditions are challenged by our pagan anti-culture and the social recklessness it engenders. Let us resolve not to succumb to the temptation to meet this anti-culture halfway. You see, don't forget, I'm quoting my husband once again because my whole intellectual formation is something that I hold to him. Every time people spoke about our culture, he got very excited. And he said, we live in an anti-culture because all the noble things, I mean, culture is simply to elevate our everyday activities and bring them closer to God. Today, we drag everything down. And so we've got to realize that, unfortunately, the tragedy today is that the intimate sphere, which is so crucial, which is such a sublime expression of the unity existing, has been dragged down on a level which is, of course, a tragedy, is pornography. Mm -hmm. Look, if I were to say, what is a sign of wisdom? Wisdom is to detect what is the greatest danger of the day. You know, I mean, very much as if I were to say to you, I'm starting an organization to fight leprosy in New York State. You're going to say, well, she's smart. There's no leprosy in New York State. Mm -hmm. The danger today is pornography. To quote Benedict XVI, dictatorial relativism, pornography, and abortion. Mm -hmm. These are the three greatest dangers. And what is pornography? Well, the devil's interpretation, the devil's way that he wants men to look at the sexual sphere. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the great mistakes which is made by good people, and I insist by good people who have good intention, is to overextend something that Aristotle said. Mm -hmm. Aristotle, who usually starts from the lower sphere, is going to say, uh, you know, we, have, we can go to extremes. We go too far in one direction, then we go back to the other direction, and the pendulum comes in the middle. In a sense, you exaggerate a truth. We go too far. Right, okay. One of the very valuable contributions that my husband makes is to say it is valid in certain spheres. You can eat too much, and become a beef. You need too little, you become anorexic. Mm -hmm. And in both cases, you harm yourself. And of course, the center is the balance. This is not true of virtue. Mm -hmm. Right, that's, I know you make that point. You know, when book, it's right. something that I insist upon because it's so incredibly worthy, it's not true of virtue. Because look, you take avariciousness. Mm -hmm. Why is a man avaricious? You recall the French novel, Le, Le, Le Père Grand, it's, it's abominable, you know, that you sit on your gold, you defy gold, you consider that to spend it. Why? Because it gives you satisfaction to feel that you possess, mm -hmm. or that you take prodigality. Well, prodigality is to spend wildly, and then you run into problems. Mm -hmm. And then you say, generosity is in between, nonsense. This is concentrated nonsense because a generous person is generous because he responds to the call of a particular value in a particular situation and responds. Well, let me ask you, what, you talk about the phrase holy bashfulness. What do you mean by that? Oh, this is, I'm so glad that you raised it because it's one of the most important things. You know, English is a beautiful language. You know, it's not my mother tongue, but I do believe I have a profound admiration for its beauty and its poetry and its... But, philosophically speaking, it's not a good language. Because if you take German or French or Spanish or Italian, there are distinctions that do not exist in English. For example, shame. Right, you're talking you about that word, You right. use the word shame for two things that are so radically different. For example, you're ashamed, for example, I steal, and you catch me, you know, and be ashamed because I've been caught. Or you take, I have a very ugly wound with pus and disgusted, I cover it because I'm ashamed of it. Or you're caught telling a lie, you're ashamed. But you also use the word shame 
for things that are mysterious, mm -hmm. that are sacred, that are private. In French, for example, or in Spanish, or in Latin, you have the word pudor, pudor which simply means a sense for mystery mm -hmm. that you hide, not because it's ugly, mm -hmm. but because it's sacred and it's intimate. Look, suppose, for example, that you receive a mystical grace, that God touches your soul. You don't go on the rooftop and say, hi, hey, you know, I just had a mystical grace, cannot imagine how exciting it is. You hide it mm -hmm. because it is your secret between you and God. Same thing when it comes to the sexual sphere. It's a mystery. It is a great mystery. And you know, from education, that the time is this small. You have to make a child understand this something beautiful. But it's very, very mysterious that you're supposed to keep veiled, that you have to keep secret. Mm. And you understand the beauty of a Catholic education from which I have benefited. You understand this something very great. Right. You keep it hidden, you keep it secret. And then in the holy sacrament of matrimony, you are permitted in front of God to unveil yourself and give yourself to another person. Right. Well, you say uh, the whole idea of what was communicated with delicacy was a sense of mystery. And you say in, in this book that my general criticism of Christopher Wesley does not seem to grasp the delicacy, reverence, privacy, and sacredness of the sexual fear. He also underestimates the effects of original sin on the human condition, which you were talking about earlier. Uh, and then you said one of the many dangers threatening us today is the widespread tendency to put the blame on others. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, look, Chesterton, who is so delightfully witty, says at the beginning of his talk, I haven't called the modern disease of saying that all the weaknesses that I have are due to my parents and to my education. You've got to realize that we, I mean, obviously you can say, well, I became addicted to pornography because my education was so puritanical. Mm -hmm. It's simply because you've got to realize that pleasure has such a powerful attraction that I don't hesitate to say, no, I say this very solemnly, one of the most difficult things in Catholic life or in Christian life is to baptize intense pleasure. And this is where innumerable men are defeated mm -hmm. because it's so attractive, because it's so powerful. And to defeat it can only be done with grace. This is why asceticism, play such a role. I mean, I, I keep reading the lives of saints. I'm amazed mm -hmm. how are setting their lives. Well, today is practically eliminated, you see. I mean, it is eliminated in convents. Sure. It is, you know, eliminated all over. And we forget that the very moment you take tragic cases that you and I know mm. of priests are very famous and then suddenly they fall. Why? Right. Right. It's always the same thing. Right. Well, it's always a, one of the things that struck me, too, because one of the things you, you kind of talk about is, uh, in general, is that there seems to be the idea that pornography, not Puritanism, is the cancer destroying our society. And a lot of times it seems to be that, uh, you know, we, we absolve these things or make them okay because we're, we're, we don't want to be Puritanical or Manichaean. And you said that Dietrich was also, would also have recognized the red herring of modern Puritanism. And you're saying clearly, and I think later on in the book you said, which, which, which would God see as more sinful, pornography or Puritanism? Well, I mean, porn pornography is a cancer of our society. Look, I know people who have small children. How do you protect them from these abominable images? And images have such a power on the human mind. And once you have it, it's very difficult to get rid of it. No, I tell you another thing, and I'm so glad that you indirectly you refer to it. One of the great, great dangers is to misinterpret Christian teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, suppose you take St. Augustine says, interfeature errorem, diligere erantem. Love, kill the error, kill, but love the sinner. Mm -hmm. Now, you take someone who is a pornographer. You take someone, I believe his name is Hugh Hefner. I truly know very little about it. I should hope well. so. I mean. All right. Look. You have to pray for him. Mm -hmm. The man has been corrupted by this and is caught in it, and we have to feel sorry and hope that at the moment of death he's going to say, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. you see. But when it comes to pornography, there is nothing that can be redeemed. And the mistake that he makes is to believe that we have to look for the good back of every Behind evil. Behind of everything, That is right. true, 
for persons, but it's, there is nothing good behind pornography. It's nothing but evil. It's devilish. It's not created by God. Whatever God created was good, but this is not created by God. It is an invention of the devil, and we have to fight against it. Well, on page 75, you said, when Christ said that those who scandalize these little ones should have a millstone around their neck, did our Savior forget to look for the good behind the evil? What is the good back of it? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the most fearful words in the gospel, because the gospel is so paradoxical, it is a good news. This is a good news. God came as saviors. On the other hand, he also speaks about eternal punishment. The most fearful words in the gospel, it would have been better for this man not to have been born. It is so heartrending that you feel you're saying, but my goodness, I wish he was still alive so that I could try to say to him, for goodness sake, hang yourself. No, I was five years old. I go to Catholic schools. And the nuns come from a little pamphlet from Paris, mm -hmm. from the slums of Paris. And a priest was speaking to the children about the betrayal of Judas. And he said, and in his despair, he hanged himself. I never forgot this. Mm -hmm. Dead silence. And a little kid from the slums of Paris raised his hand. Father, why did he hang himself on Christ's neck? I had tears in my eyes, and I still do today. It's one of the most beautiful things that shows that a child's soul is open to God. Mm -hmm. Why didn't he hang himself on Christ's neck? Mm -hmm. so you say here, we live in a world where confusion reigns supreme. Christ has warned us that at the end of time, men will be so perplexed that even the elect might be seduced. And this is the time that we're, this is what Cardinal, you know, he gave me the privilege of me to visit me for one full hour. And at the end, when he lays, he said, we have entered apocalyptic because there is confusion among good people. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't speak about being good people because I'm confused, because all these distinctions are not properly made. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in a, you kind of relate to EWTN here on this particular page. And you I, deserve it. I remember Mother Angelica talking about this as well, the idea that compassion has today often been hijacked. With the help of some sociological scientists, a technique has now been developed that actually claims it's practically impossible to commit a mortal sin. Compassion for the sinner, but no compassion for the sin. The sin is a slap in the face of grace. And today, I, I mean, as I said, probably lack of proper philosophical formation. Mm -hmm. And you know, let me repeat whatever work I have done, modest as it was, I have to give You're always modest. No, we know well, that. I mean, you know, it doesn't hurt, does it? No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, take, you take my husband. You know, his love for truth, his incredible talent for making the proper distinctions. I mean, you know, and then on his deathbed, saying to me when he confided this big question, saying, if you find a single word not in agreement with the teaching of the church, tear it up. These are things that give me a feeling of awe and love and admiration. Mm -hmm. And so every time I'm, I'm a show, or give a talk, I feel I have to give him credit. Right. Now, page 74, and you were kind of alluding to this early on in the, in the interview, the devil always apes God. We should speak today of a diabolical trinity, relativism, abortion, and pornography. Yes. And I mean, abortion is a fruit of feminism. You know, right now, probably it's going to be my last article because it's about time to step down. You know, feminism, feminism is one of the greatest dangers existing today. I tell you something. The moment that a woman claims that she has a right to become a priest because she's just as good as men, in this very moment, I feel some sort of incarnation of the devil. Because you know what the mission of women is? It is to be the mother of priests. Just as Mary was a mother of the one who said, I am life itself. And her mission was to give mother to the priest who is the only priest because there's only one priest, which is Christ. And I simply say one thing is certain. This is a grandiose, magnificent mission of women to give birth to priests. Now look, St. Peter tells us in his second epistle something which is not very cheerful. At the end of time, the world will be blown up and nothing will remain but dust and ashes of all the works of men and machines and the rest are gone. What is going to remain? Every child to whom a woman has given birth 
because he is an immortal soul. If that is not glorious, I do not know what is. And you know, my last word truly is the following. The relationship between men and women is so magnificent that in order for me to relate positively to the other sex, which has been created to me in my lab, you have to understand the beauty of your own sex. And what you do, you have the key to the other sex. Let me ask you, uh, are you playing Cassandra when it comes to criticizing West's perspective in the sense of being a dualist? That seems to be the you problem. Know, you know, I do the very opposite. You know, I simply am convinced that he had so many talents and education, my goodness, I which I had this gift of, of addressing people. I mean, he wins them over immediately. He has so many talents and oh, so many possibilities. I don't think that he has had a proper philosophical formation. And he doesn't realize that certain of his formulations are open to misunderstandings. What would you say to people just saying, well, he's just trying to reach different people who maybe <laughs> haven't been, uh, at least he gets their attention and he gets them to think about it? You're talking to the wrong person. Okay. I spent 37 years of my life in a place where from day one, my colleagues made me understand that I didn't belong. I did not belong in a secular university. I belonged in a small Catholic college in the Midwest. That's where I belonged. <laughs> no, the amazing thing is, the number of students who found their way to the church. Why? Because I did not use their language. I did not fall down on the level that was very, very different from what, you know, the canonesses of St. Augustine has taught me when I was in Belgium. I tried to appeal to what's deepest in every human soul, where people don't even know that there's something so deep and so beautiful in them. And through your language and your presentation, if you awaken this in them, in one, two, three, they discover that there is truth. And the moment they discover truth, they discover that this was just, uh, am the truth. Mm -hmm. Is that why, uh, in, in, in the beginning of the book, you, you kind of uh, refer to your husband, you say, between procreation and copulation, Dietrich saw an abyss separating persons incarnated into a body and animals. Do you see that that's the distinction that's happened in a lot of cases here, that we've lost sight of, of the difference between copulation and procreation? Well, I mean, of course, you see, one thing is, the amazing thing about marriage is the fruitfulness of love. I mean, I mean, this is why my husband linked love to procreation very deeply. You know, do you know that he was the first Catholics in 1930 to oppose the, uh, the Lambeth uh, Conference. Okay. First one. He was the first, one, that was the right. first okay. one in 68 mm. to write a booklet to, to, I mean, to defend humanity. He saw that so profoundly. But you see, love has to be fruitful. It mm. is fruitful by its very lesson. But please listen. It's not only biological procreation. Mm -hmm. You take and this is my book, Man and Woman, a Divine Invention, the relationship between saints, when both of them were either consecrated, virgin, and the fruitfulness of a love between St. Francis of Sales and St. Jean Francois de Chantal, the number of souls that they want. Why? Because love is fruitful, but it's not only biological. In eternity, there'd be neither marriage nor getting married. It's odd. But what remains is the fruitfulness of love. Well, you say here that uh, the great task of a truly Christian education is to baptize pleasure. How do yes. you baptize pleasure? Well, I mean, you know, that's, a, that's my formulation. I think it's very impressive. It must be purified because this origin, I mean, look, the fruit on the tree was very appealing. Had it been an all rotten fruit, nobody would have taken it, but it looks so beautiful and appealing and juicy. And therefore, it must be attractive. And you see, the tragedy is that God meant certain things to be pleasurable. But the very moment that pleasure became so main motivation, I mean, it's a great task in marriage mm -hmm. to baptize pleasure. You know, in the sense that love of the sport, the good of the sport, the closeness to God has precedence. Over, and of course it is given to God. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, we've got to realize that it should not be the primary motivation, which is very difficult for fallen nature. Just before we go, why did you dedicate this book to His Eminence Raymond Cardinal Burke? What? Why did you dedicate it to Cardinal Burke, this particular book? Because I've had many blessings in my life. And I hope that on my deathbed, one of my last words is going to say thank you. 
and one of them was meeting Cardinal Bergman years ago. We've been in close contact. He has been a tremendous help for me. And I mean, one thing is certain, I'm dedicating this book to him because I have a very, very head of attitude. He's one of the great men in the church. Let us thank God for him. Very good. And let us thank God for you as well, Dr. Von Hildebrand. Always great to see you. Spend time. We're out of time, as we always are when we get talking about uh, things of your interest. The Dark Night of the Body, uh, Alice Von Hildebrand, Why Reverence Comes First in Intimate Relations, published by Roman Catholic Books, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. Thank you for joining us on a special on-location EWTN bookmark. See you next time.